I believe we're going to get there, how we can leap over a wall, how we can run through a troop. Amen? How we can do all things. Let's look at our foundation scripture, Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13. Hallelujah. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And we know there that Christ, it's meaning the anointing. And we have found out that the blessing, which is an empowerment, an empowerment to prosper in every area of our life, to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, to take dominion, to replenish. We also have found out that resurrection power, resurrection is not a place, it's not an event. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. And so we know that resurrection is Jesus. So Jesus, the resurrection power, the anointing, the blessing, it's all in those that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We have strength to overcome anything Satan might throw at us. Jesus didn't come just to make our normal sinful lives better in that we know we're going to go to heaven in the sweet by and by. He made it for us to walk in today. To walk in today. To be victorious today. Amen? And we saw that we have three choices to determine whether we walk in the favor or grace of God. There's obedience, consistency. And what we say is what we hear and see and what we say is what we will do so we must develop a lifestyle of obedience and we looked at joshua 1 8. we saw that there's two key principles with the word of god one is god's word will never negate itself it won't say one thing in genesis something else in deuteronomy something else in judges and something else in galatians and something else in in first thessalonians and something else in revelation God never changes his mind. That's the second key principle. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he started with the blessing, as you flow through it, he ends with the blessing. And that was why Jesus came back, to get that back into the earth. God wants us to see the big picture, which is his kingdom being operating in the earth. Remember, there is a difference between who you are and what the word says you are. You might feel something, but how you feel is dependent on the thoughts you take in. And those thoughts are either positive or negative, and those thoughts will either make you an overcomer or they will defeat you, one or the other. So we had looked at that. We saw that we're supposed to cast down imaginations, anything opposite to the word of God we are to get rid of. And one way of knowing is this thought from God, does it bring peace? I didn't say he didn't bring a warm, fuzzy feeling. Sometimes we can think, oh, well, it's all my, my brother's fault, or it was the person in the lineup before me at Safeway. It's all their fault. This is why I feel that way. And it might give us a warm, fuzzy feeling to blame somebody else. But I'm talking about does it bring peace in our inner man that, yes, this is something that's going to put me over and make me walk the way God wants me to walk. There's a difference. We saw that we're to renew our mind. You know, we might have a, a crowded heart. We produce 30, 60, and 100. And the percentage that we produce fruit is directly in proportion to the amount of word we have allowed to settle into our heart and we walk out. If we're not a doer of the word, we're self-deceived. We can hear it all day long, but if we don't do it and put it into action, we become self-deceived and it's not going to do any good in our heart. Then we also saw that obedience comes before understanding. We are to be willing. Jesus said, and we looked at this in John 15 or John 7, and he said, if you're willing to do my will, you will understand. If we're not willing to do his will, we will not understand. And that's John 7, verse 16 to 18. If we're not willing, we will not receive revelation knowledge. And so God says, we say we're willing, and God says, well, like he did to Abraham, leave your home. Where am I going to go? I'll show you. Just leave. Are you kidding me? Until you show me every step that I'm going to take. You kidding me? I'm not going. Now, we don't say it quite that way, but it boils down to that. You kidding me? 
and God says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. You take that first step, and I'll show you where the next step goes. If we're willing, we will receive understanding and direction for the next step. Amen? So when we believe the truth, it brings freedom. When we believe a lie, we give power to the lie to bring some level of bondage into our lives. So it is important to be aware of the subtle lies that Satan tries to bring to us. And those lies of his are always to put us down, to make us feel less than what God has said about us. So in order to walk in this, in order to be the can-do generation, in order to be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us, we need the empowerment. And that empowerment is grace. Let's look at 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Let's read it of the New Living Translation, please. Now, I don't know if, how many of you remember or were here the very first week when we started this. And I talked about if anybody remembered as a kid or seeing these clowns that are full of air and they have sand on the bottom and you, your child would punch them, or you might, or maybe you'd kick them, and they'd fall down and pop back up. They'd fall down and pop back up. But eventually they got walked on and got holes in them. And the air escaped. You could say that the plastic part is the body. The air is your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. That sand that holds it steady is your spirit. So anyway, so now somebody's walked on you and the air is coming out. And the air comes out because it affects your soul and it's affecting your soul because of your mind is allowing it to affect you and you're thinking about it. And somebody comes along and says, oh, that's all right. And they put a Band-Aid on. And then I said, remember, you pull that Band-Aid off, it's like on a sore, and every time you pull it off, it gets worse. Every time you rehash what somebody did to you, how they put that hole in you, you are rehashing it, and you're letting out everything, and your soul is going wild. It's like, there it goes. But your spirit man is still there. Remember, you will produce 30, 60, 100 fold. If you just allow some of it in, then you're just sort of laying there 60. You might do a little bit of good. You might have a bit of bounce. But we have to know that when we've been stepped on, what can we do to make us stand up and overcome? How can we do all things? It says through Christ who strengthens us, through the anointing, through the blessing, through resurrection power. But we saw how we have to renew our mind and be a doer of the word. The thing that will change it, you need to change the air in it so that when somebody steps on it and there might be a hole, the air in it will repair itself. I think, you know, you can take a tire that's flat and it has a hole in it and you can pump something in it and it seals it. Is, am I right, George? It will seal it. Okay, so we want to put something in that balloon That'll seal it. So it'll just keep coming up every time it's punched. And what will seal that hole is the word. But how does that work? Well, the grace of God. How is that? Let's look at Paul here in verse 9, New Living Translation. Here he had asked God. He had the messenger of Satan who came to buffet him. And he, God said to him, each time he said, my gracious favor is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ or the anointing may work through me. The message translation said, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. And so I asked myself, how does 
that affect my life? And I thought, well, it's not going to affect my life until I know what that grace is. My grace is sufficient. Great. God, send your grace so it'll be sufficient. How will I recognize the grace if I don't know what it is? He might have sent it to me. So how's that going to affect me? The King James said, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And because religion didn't know that it was talking about something other than saying, God, how many people heard God said, you know what? You just suffer with that, boy. You just keep suffering with it, and my grace is sufficient. You can endure faithful to the end. God does not want us to suffer with anything. Financial lack, sickness, disease, nothing, no thing. And there's all kinds of crazy things about that thorn in the flesh and and what they say is wrong. But if we don't understand the grace and the empowerment of it and how to tap into it, besides saying, oh God, send more grace. More grace, more grace. There's that prophecy of Kenneth Copeland for 2013, grace. And we might get to reading that. But there's going to be more grace. So sometimes we think, well, you know what? I'm just going to stand there in faith and read that confession. We're supposed to believe it. Read that prophecy. More grace. Going to be more grace. I believe for more grace. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. But I don't know what I'm believing for. And I won't recognize it when it comes. And it won't help me unless I understand it. Faith changes situations. Grace changes people. Faith moves mountains. We've heard the scripture. We've studied it. We look at it. It's Brother Kenneth Hagin's taught on it. Mark 11. Whosoever shall say to that mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and doubts not in his heart, but believes that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. So, faith is going to move that mountain. Grace will keep that mountain from moving me before I see it in the natural realm. Because too often we have released our faith and we believe it, and then that mountain turns around and bites us. But remember, we said God last week is our rear guard. So what is it that I need to keep me from having that mountain move me? Grace. Okay? Grace. Great. How is that going to help me? What's that going to do for me? What does it look like? You see, first we are changed and then we can bring change to a situation. We want to change situations and then maybe because everything's sweet and nice around us, now I will change. But Satan will see to it that whatever is nice around me for that moment will end up, it's like milk sitting there, it's You pour it, it's nice. But you leave it sit there, it'll turn sour and bitter. We need to have that strength. I can do all things through the anointing that strengthens me. I need it in such a way that no mountain will move me again. That I in faith can speak to that mountain, it will be removed and that mountain will never move me. And we sort of have, for three weeks, talked about this, bringing it in, things we needed to do. Number one was obedience, and one is we do it. We say, your will, Father, not mine, and we do what he tells us to do. And one, he's told us to renew our mind. We want our balloon, our, this, this clown that wouldn't come up anymore, 
to be filled with something so that it's plugged. And when that mountain comes back and steps on it, it will not just stay down. Its soul realm will not get so tainted by it that it can't get back up. Remember, who was persecuting Paul? His brothers and sisters, fellow Jews. It wasn't some heathen nation out somewhere. It wasn't the Philistines. It wasn't the Romans. It was his brothers and sisters. It was the Pharisees. And he said, I was a chief of Pharisees. I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. The very people he studied with, the greatest teacher at that time, Gamaliel, he sat at his feet. He was respected. He was honored. And those were the very people that tried to kill him. And we go, you wouldn't believe what my friend did to me. And God said to him, no matter what they've done to you, my grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter how they've stepped on you, how they've beaten you, how you've been left for dead. My grace is sufficient. And he rose up every time. Hallelujah. Because he got something in him that changed his soul realm. Grace is the power source to bring change on the inside. We are changed by God's influence inside. Grace is our ability to do what we couldn't do without the grace. Or without the power, or without the anointing, or without resurrection power, or without the blessing. But it originates with grace. Noah said... um, Definition, free unmerited love and favor of God, the spring and source of all the benefits men receive from him. Favorable influence of God, divine influence or the influence of the spirit in renewing the heart and restraining from sin. So what's that? How do I get that influence of God in my life? You know, it's easy to say these things. But we have prayed the eyes of our understanding enlightened. We need enlightenment on this subject. Because if we don't get enlightenment on it, we are speaking something without ever being able to have that power source that we have on the inside of us doing what God wants it to do. So let's look first at Hebrews 1.8. Hebrews 1.8. I'm going to, before we read that, I want to talk about Esther. Esther went. She was a Jew, and and so this king got rid of his queen. Mordecai came to her and said, you got to be the queen. You got to stand there and be the next queen. And she didn't want to, and he says, you've got to do it. So she did, and she was chosen. She spent time getting herself all beautified, and she was chosen. Then Mordecai came and said, look, you're going to have to go to the king, because this is what Mordecai's done. She says, I can't do that. If he doesn't accept me, I'm dead. So she went to him. Mordecai said, if, if, we'll survive, but either way, if you don't, you'll die. She went to him uninvited. And if you go to a king uninvited in his court, you could be done. Unless the scepter is held out to you. A scepter of righteousness saying, you're right with me. You can come on. I accept it. And he held that scepter out to her. And when she spoke and asked the request of him, he said to her, It's granted. 
Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. That scepter of righteousness has been held out to us, giving us complete access to the throne of grace. To the throne of unmerited favor. Esther went to the throne and the scepter was put out and she asked and got her request. Jesus' throne is forever settled and he has the scepter of righteousness. And that is held out and when I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, what happened? I became the righteousness of God in Christ. The scepter of righteousness was held out to me and I was accepted. I am righteous before God in Christ. Grace was given. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, please. I'm going to read that out of um, the Amplified to begin with, starting with verse 10. So now we see, and it says, For he who has once entered God's rest. Now, first of all, we know Jesus did. Has ceased from the weariness and pain of human labors, just as God rested from these labors, peculiarly his own. New Living, for he who entered into God's rest will find rest from their labors. Anything done apart from grace is works. So if we don't know what grace is, how are we going to do it with grace? Just as God rested after creating the world. Verse 11, let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves. So it's telling us we have to do something in order to enter the rest of God. We sort of want to go, huh, okay, God, I'm resting in you. What's your next move? Oh, and and we're thinking like, you know, there's this little ragtag thing and, and he's going to grab us and like like you know a chessboard and he's going to pick this up and he's just going to and we don't have to do anything let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest so there is a striving to enter the rest of God and to know and experience it for ourselves that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the desert fell. What caused those in the desert to fall? We all say unbelief. Well, unbelief isn't not believing something. What did they believe? They should have believed God. We know that. What did they believe that caused them not to enter in? They saw the giants. They thought the giants were bigger than them. And in the natural, they were. God said, I have given you the land. And their unbelief was they did not believe God gave it to them. And if they did believe God gave it to them, they thought they were going to have to go hand-to-hand combat with these giants and defeat them. God never said anything about that. He never said we have to go out there and defeat sickness and disease on our own. He never said we have to go out there and fight poverty on our own. They looked at the giants and said, God's given us this land, great, but now we have to fight for it. 
We're going to have to take out all these giants. And they said, would we were in Egypt. You just brought us out here to let us die in the wilderness. They totally looked at it as to what could we do in this situation. And we are doing that. What can I do instead of what can he do through me? Remember, it's I can do all things through the anointing that strengthens me. And he's saying, don't want you to perish the way they did. I don't want you to look at this and have you think that everything that comes against you is going to have to be fought by you any more than Paul had to fight that messenger of Satan. The grace fought the messenger of Satan, but Paul had to do something. And we see later that he found out what his authority was and he released his authority and got rid of that stuff. So where thing is, we are not entering into our rest because we're trying to do it in our own natural ability. Then verse 12, for the word of God speaks, for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of the life, soul, and the immortal spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Oh, so what's he saying here? We had found out that we are to renew our mind according to the word of God so we can prove what the perfect and will of God is. The discerner, the word, will cut through and show you if you're doing it by works or according to grace. It'll show you if you're walking in pride or if you're being humble. And we're going to look at that some more later. But when you honestly take in the word of God. Now let me say something here. Too often people have taken the word of God as a textbook. Like like a history book. And they read it. Oh, God did that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, he did that. Oh, wow. And we read it like an ancient history book. And we memorize a bunch of stuff. And it goes nowhere. The word of God was written to us to reveal to us how much our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, loves us. Everything in here is poured from a heart of love. Everything he asks us to do is from a heart of love. In 1 John, it says, my commandments aren't grievous. What I'm asking you to do is not going to cause you grief. And we look at it as a bunch of do's and don'ts. And if I don't do it right, God's going to smack me upside the head. And God's saying, I love you so much. I sent Jesus for you. God so loved the world, he gave Jesus. Because I don't want you to be under the influence of the devil anymore. I don't want the mountains to be crushing you. He says, I love you. You're valuable and precious to me and I have given my very life for you. And that's what the word of God is to reveal to us. And when we take the word of God, and it's alive, we read it's alive, and we look at it and say, oh, my father, you're telling me I can come boldly and talk to you. You're telling me that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Oh, oh, father, you love me so much. You see, then you are becoming intimately acquainted with the heart of the Father. And you're no longer under a works program. If I spend enough time praying, if I spend enough time fasting, if I spend enough time reading the word, and all we're doing is read, yes, we're to read the word. We're to renew our mind with it. 
For what was the end result to find out that he loved me so much? He gave me Jesus and did everything I'm ever going to need to be able to be successful in life. If I'll just do what he told me to do. Just do what he told me to do. And then we think, somebody said, insanity, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over all the time, expecting different results. And there's where pride comes in. We think, well, I'm doing okay. Look at me. I'm doing fine. Look at the person over there. They're not doing so fine. I'm doing fine. I don't have to change. That's pride. And that's based on your own works. That's always, always, when you pick up the Bible, think of it as the love letter from your father. Him showing his love for you. And he's de- revealing things to you so you can walk in the victory that he's purchased for you. We talk about fellowship. There's no other way that you can have fellowship with the Father. And the minute you think, when you, if you had children, but whoever it is, as a teacher in school, whatever it is, you give an instruction for somebody's benefit. And you're training them and teaching them, and they say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, no, no. It's hard to fellowship with that person. It is. It's hard to fellowship with your child that way. We have three children, a bunch of grandchildren. And every one of our children that we have fellowship with, it's different. We love them all equally, no difference. But there's a different fellowship with the children based on their interests. The best way I can fellowship with Timon, we fellowship around the word, etc. But outside of the word of God and sharing the word is to talk about the Oilers. Oh, dear Jesus, just bring up the Oilers. You know, best way I can fellowship with my husband, bring up the Oilers. I'm still having trouble with American football. It's kind of hard. But talk about the Oilers. Talk about sports. Sports. So it's different than, say, my fellowship with Carolyn, my my daughter. Uh, Her and I, you know, we might say a little bit about sports when the men are around and we get involved in the conversation a bit, but then we sort of drift off. And invariably, we're talking about, did you see that in such and such a scripture? Or we might talk about gardening or something. We love them all equal, but our fellowship is different. But if they came, if I walked up to David and I I said something, um, or he said something to me about sports, and I said, I think that's stupid. Where's our fellowship? It's cut off in that area, right? Well, that's exactly what we do with God. He tells us something and we go, I think that's stupid. I don't have to do that. I have cut off my fellowship. But taking in the word of God will cut through that and reveal, if I'm honest, when I go to my father and I fellowship with him on his word and find out what he wants to talk about. I don't go to him talking about the oilers. I just don't do that. I do with David, Timon, but I don't, don't with, with my Heavenly Father. That's not the subject he's interested in. That's not high on his priority list. So my fellowship is his word. And then when he tells me something and I go, eh, I've broken that fellowship. We're still talking about empowerment, grace, to be able to do all things, to be the can-do generation. Verse 13, And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 
We can't lie to him. We can't cover it up. He sees through it all. He sees our motives. He sees our intentions. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him, saying the same thing he says, saying what he says about us. Remember, the scepter of righteousness is held out. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation, such as what Paul had gone through, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. So God understands. Jesus understands what we're going through. But it doesn't say to go to him and say, hey, look, this is what I'm going through. You won't believe this, Jesus. Oh, dear Jesus, you won't believe what David said to me. Oh, you won't believe what Laurel said to me. Oh, dear Jesus, you won't believe it. He didn't say that. He says, hold fast our confession of what? Faith in him. Believing in him. My confession is my belief in Jesus and what he accomplished for me. Not coming there telling him the problem. Let us, because of all that, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near where? To the throne of what? As Esther went before the throne, the scepter was held out to her. We now, when we're going through all these temptations, what are we to do? We are to come with confidence. Confidence in what? That we're accepted. And the Amplified says that we may receive mercy. Mercy is for our failures. I've messed up. I missed it. I blew it. Mercy. I don't ask for justice. I don't come bragging about myself how good I am. Mercy means forgiveness. His loving kindness which goes beyond what he needs to do. So I'm coming boldly like Ruth Ruth went, Esther went, and she needed something, and she got it. I'm going, and he is forgiving me. I have mercy for any problem. I didn't have to go up there and justify myself. I didn't have to go and do penance for 355 days. I missed it. And he will give me mercy when I come boldly and tell him who I am in Christ. Because in Christ, I have every right to be at the throne of God. And I cry mercy. And he says, forgiven. The blood. I plead the blood. The blood. And he gives me mercy and doesn't hold that against me. And we will see that in James later. He does gives us wisdom and he doesn't hold it from us. And I cry mercy and he gives me mercy. But I don't tell him what I needed mercy for. He already knows. And grace, his unmerited favor, his empowerment to help me in good time for every need. Appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when I need it. So I'm going to the throne of grace. Where are those definitions? I am going to the throne of free, unmerited love and favor. The spring and source of all the benefits that men receive from God. I am going to the throne. I get forgiveness. I have mercy given to me. And then I am going and I get favorable influence of God. Divine influence of the influence of the spirit in renewing the heart and restraining from sin. Oh, hallelujah. That's what I get. So it's a time of more grace. So we're crying grace. Well, how do we get, what is grace? What's the unmerited favor of God? How does that work in me? I might know what it is now, but how does that work and how is that activated 
in me. Second Peter 3.18, and we're going to end here because it's going to take a long time to go through this next, and then it'll be in a couple weeks. Oh, I'm in First Peter, and I'm thinking, that's not the scripture I want. Where am I to go? Three. But grow in grace. Grow in God's favor. Grow in his unmerited love. Grow in the spring and source of all the benefits I can receive. Grow in the favorable influence of God. Grow in the divine influence of the influence of the Spirit. Grow in the renewing of the heart and restraining from sin. Grow in that. Grow in the grace. And and here's a connection. In the knowledge. So grace and knowledge are connected. We saw how we're to renew our mind. Grace and knowledge of what? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. We haven't gotten to how this works yet, but we're working on it. So we can grow in it. And if we're to grow in something and it's connected to knowledge, it's not like, Oh, give me grace, give me grace, 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 more grace, more grace. I need more grace. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. And we sing a song, and we're all excited. And I'm out here, and suddenly somebody steps on me, and I let all this air out, and I'm flat on the ground. But we are the can-do generation. We can do all things through the anointing. By the time we finish this study, which I thought was going to be today, but it isn't today, so it'll be another day, we are going to find out how to grow in the grace and the knowledge through our Lord Jesus Christ and be the can-do generation that no matter what the devil uses against us. And remember, Satan uses people. Thoughts come in, people say things. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Is anybody excited about this but me? I read something in the word and I say, God, how does this work in my life? It doesn't do me any good to know that I'm saved by grace through faith. What what, 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 what does that mean? And as I said before, if we're saved by grace through faith, what happened to the blood? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But there it says by grace. But if it's by grace, I don't need the blood. And if it's by grace and I don't need the blood, then why did Jesus come? And if we don't know what it's talking about, it's not going to work. And that's why I said one of the principles of God we've got to understand. He does not change. And everything he sets out builds. And it builds. But it's not all of a sudden here in this part of the Bible we need the blood of Jesus. And this part we suddenly don't. So they have to be connected. Right? They have to be connected. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.